So last week we had our baptism. And I, I tell you, baptisms bless me. And they just speak to my heart, to my soul, in a way that few things do. Um, last week I was especially blessed because um, I got to baptize a number of people, but, but also I got to watch as two fathers got to baptize their sons. And that was, that just blessed me. Um, you know, there's nothing special about a pastor that their baptisms mean anything more than anyone else. And to me, uh, to, to see Christian fathers baptizing their Christian sons just, just spoke to me. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but all week I have been thinking about that and dwelling on that and being blessed by that. And so I just, I just want to say uh, an amen and give praise to God. <coughs> that was an incredible thing that we got to see last week. Um, if you did take pictures of the baptism, could you get them to either Christy or I? We want to put some up on the web page, um, put some up on Facebook, so our friends and family that aren't here with us anymore, <coughs> the McCormicks, the SIs, the Kidders, uh, TJ, so they can see what's going on and what's happened. Um, you know, that's a good way for everybody to keep in touch. Those that weren't able to be here last week can, can see what was going on. So if you have pictures of those, uh, please let me know, see if we can get them to Christy or I, and we can get that put up on the, the web page. Um, we are at the end, except that the end might come in two parts, <laughs> because I've been, you're used to that, you're used to that? <laughs> Mary Lou, you're such an encouragement to me. <laughs> um, because I can't separate the two things that I want to address today. We, we really, they, they go hand in hand. And I can't minimize them either. Okay, so I feel like I want to give them an appropriate amount of time. So we are in the essentials of our faith. These are the things that we need to believe to be able to worship together, to be corporate. Um, now we've talked about a number of things. We've talked about, we started off with the inerrancy of the Bible, okay? And I, I started with that, and some people would say, well, why wouldn't you start with, with God, the sovereignty of God, the, the one God triune uh, aspect of it? Why wouldn't you start off with, with Jesus and salvation? And Well, because all of that comes to us through this, okay? And we base all of that off of this, the word that he's given us. So the first thing we need to clarify, the first thing we need to understand is we can trust this. Okay? Because there are a lot of people out there, there are a lot of cults out there that want to discredit this. And say, oh, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not the same thing that was written originally. Something happened to it and it got corrupted. To which we can say, no. The historicity and the authenticity of this is intact. Because we can follow it down from at least 200 years before Christ. And we've got record of it ever since. And people go, oh, well, uh, you know, um, that's just because that's what the church has. Well, we've got the documents. We have more original manuscripts, original copies of this than any other book of antiquity that has ever been written. But nobody doubts Homer or Caesar or Tacitus. No, nobody ever questions the authenticity of those. It's just this one. Why? Because this one speaks to us. So we have to establish that first. We have to agree that this is accurate. That it's what God intended for us. Okay? If you can't agree with that, then it's like trying to... Um, 
What's a, what would be a good example? It'd be like trying to cook in two different kitchens, one meal. We're going to make scrambled eggs. I've got the eggs in my kitchen. And Skip, you have the pan in yours. Go! <laughs> it's not going to work. And so the first thing you need to establish when you are talking with someone about the things of God is you can trust this. Okay? So we dealt with that. Then we dealt with monotheism. What is monotheism? One God. Mono, one theism, God. One God. Coexistent, co-eternal in three parts. That's what we dealt with the next week. The Trinity. Okay? The sh Shema. Did I say that right? Shema. Shema. What is the Shema, Dennis? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Even in that statement, the way that God chose to reveal himself in that statement reveals a plurality. The word that he used meant more than one. Okay? And you go, well, how can it be one and more than one? Because he's God. Okay? Ultimately, the simplest way to understand this is your brain is too small to understand God. Okay? Our, our brains just aren't big enough to wrap ourselves around God. That's why he wraps himself around us. He's God, we're not. Okay? If we operate from that premise, we'll do okay. He's God, we're not. Okay? So, we dealt with one God in three parts. And then we dealt with each of those parts. We dealt with God the Father. We dealt with God the Son. We dealt with God the Holy Spirit. Dealing with the Son. We talked about him, the hypostatic union. Remember what that was? The fancy word for that? The hypostatic union. Remember this? Everybody do it with me. Fully God and fully man. Okay? You got it? You, you, you'll never forget it. As soon as I said hypostatic union, Vivian's going... <laughs> got it. Okay? And we, we talked about what an incredible thing God did in creating that. Okay? And how that was necessary. We talked about the virgin birth. Now there's, there's people out there that go, oh, the virgin birth isn't one of the essentials. I'm sorry. For me, it's got to be essential because he has to be unique. He can't be like us because if he were like us, he would be a part of the sin nature, and a sinner cannot redeem a sinner. It doesn't work. The sacrifice had to be perfect and pure, completely holy. That's why the virgin birth is an essential as far as I'm concerned. And I, I, I you know, I've gone to, uh, oh yeah, it's essential, but it's a secondary essential. That's like saying, oxygen is a secondary essential. So long as your heart is beating, you're okay. I personally like my heart to beat with oxygen. That makes my life better. Okay? So, I'm sorry. I, I can't remove that as anything but an essential. Okay? Then we talked about his perfect life. We talked about his atoning death. We talked about his resurrection. Because all of those are essentials. Why? We'll talk a little bit about that today. Because see, all of these things, the way this works, is all of these things go like this. To make a picture. Okay? They're not like this, where you look at one and then maybe look at another and, and you, you see them as completely separate. If you're seeing them as completely separate, you've missed the picture that God's created because they're all meant to go like this and create a one, a whole. Okay? So we talked about uh, Jesus. Then we moved on to man. And we dealt with that in a couple parts because. We have to deal with the problem, and we talked about original sin, and the nature of sin, and our propensity to sin, and our desire to sin, and our habit of sin, and the fact that just, sin is just everywhere. And the fact that we sin and don't even realize it's sin. But the story didn't end there, because then we talked about redemption. 
And, and see how that ties right back into Jesus, which ties right back into God, and all of which is brought around to us by the inerrancy of Scripture. Okay? So, we talked about redemption, and I actually spent a couple weeks on redemption, and, and quite honestly, I struggle today with not spending a third week on redemption. How many of you did the homework that Robin was so gracious to remind us of? Oh, come on, put them up. If you did the homework, be proud. Okay. Did you guys really catch a glimpse in the book of Galatians about the gospel and about what God was doing and what Paul was writing to the Galatians about another gospel? Because, see, we do that. I do this. Okay? I struggle with this every day. Fully convinced that I could do nothing to merit salvation. I could do nothing to earn it. But that somehow or another, I have to do something to maintain it. Every day, it's, oh, I gotta, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. And, and every day he reminds me, no, no, look, look. What you have to do is move into me. I will take care of all of that. Okay? And, and we see that in the book of Galatians. Paul is reminding them, <coughs> having begun the race by the Holy Spirit, do you now think that you can continue it through your own strength? Yeah? No, you can't! Oh, crud, I got that one wrong. <laughs> but don't, uh, okay. I know I'm the only one that does it, but just bear with me, okay? So we dealt with redemption. So today, we're coming up to the end. Dun, dun, dun. The end of what? Yep. The end of what? Yep, that's exactly right. Because, see, we look at it as the end because this is all we know. But, but God looks at this as, you know, right now, we're still in birth pains. We, we've yet to be completely delivered of this. And everything that we've dealt with up to this point, and, and part of what we're dealing today, um, they're essentials unto justification and sanctification. Okay? You have to believe these to be justified and to be sanctified. And what is sanctification? Remember, look at your little yellow sheet. What is sanctification? Being set apart. It's being made holy. What is holy? Being set apart. Okay? God takes you from the mass of it, and he takes you out, and he cleans you up, and he makes you his own. Okay? That's, that's sanctification. But there's also a third part of this called glorification. Ooh, what does that mean? Well, anybody want to venture a guess? See, that's what all this is about. Okay? This is all about what happens at the end or the beginning. When we get to the end of this life, then what? Because if you are not convinced that eternity is an essential, oh, you don't have to believe that there's an eternity then really salvation is just this? <clears throat> really? That's it? Well, that's not what Scripture says. As a matter of fact, um, I'm kind of going out of order, but I think this is important. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to read in 1 Corinthians 
I'm going to start in verse 12. And Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He's writing about the resurrection of the dead. So verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Okay, Paul is making kind of a, a, an emphatic point here. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see that? See, this right here is why I believe eternity has to be an essential. Because Paul makes it very clear, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Okay? Because Paul makes it very clear in his writings, this is the race, this is the endurance run. This is the trial and the tribulation that we are pressing through to what end? The prize. The, the prize at the end. What is the prize? That's right, eternal life. Now see, the two things that we need to cover today, and I'm just going to touch on them today. We might go a little bit more in depth next week. But the first thing is, I don't care what your particular eschatological view is. Come again, Pastor Glenn? <laughs> I don't care what your view on the end times is. Okay? I'm not concerned about your, your view on the rapture. I'm not concerned about your view on the second coming. I'm not concerned about your view on the seven years of the tribulation. I, I'm not concerned about that in particular. What I'm concerned about is, are you convinced that he's coming back? Okay? Because see, the timing is not the problem. And we make it the problem, don't we? Mm -hmm. Wow, do we make it the problem. The problem is, or the concern is, do we believe, are we convinced, do we stand in faith believing that he is coming back? Okay? If... That's the first part. That's the first condition. He is coming back. And we're going to talk about that. But the second part of that would be, why? Okay? Do you believe he's coming back? If you believe he's coming back, why is he coming back? Yep. But it's not just to get us. <coughs> Okay? It's not just to get us. It's to set things right. It's to put back things into the original intended order. Okay? So let's look at some scriptures. First, John chapter 3. Can you guys guess where I'm going? Oh, no, we're not going there. I'm on the wrong page. <coughs> Don't go to John 3 yet. That's going to be probably next week. We're going to go to John 14. John chapter 14, verse 1. 
Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Boy, we could make a sermon right off of that, couldn't we? Right? In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go... Let me try that again. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Okay? So first, we see right off the bat that Jesus is telling us, have faith. Remember our equation for salvation? What is our equation for salvation? Grace plus faith equals salvation. Arrow, after salvation, works. Because works is never unto salvation, it's a result of salvation. Okay? So, for those of you trying to earn your salvation or maintain your salvation, you can't. Because it's faith plus grace, grace plus faith equals salvation. Okay? Works come as a result of that because God's created works for you to do, stuff for you to do. Not to get into heaven. Okay? So believe. Don't be troubled. Don't, don't be troubled. If, boy, I tell you what, if we could live here, we could get rid of all the antacid in the world. <laughs> could we? Maylox bankrupt. Tums out of business. They'd actually have to work on creating a flavor so they could sell them as candy. Instead of chalk. <laughs> Let not your hearts be troubled. Over and over and over again, Jesus tells us, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Don't, 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 don't. And what do we do? You do, do, do. <laughs> yeah. Why do we worry? Because we can't see the future. You don't need to see the future. God isn't asking you to know all things. He's asking you to trust Him. Okay? Because He does know all things. This Friday night, who's coming out for the movie night? Amen. It's going to be awesome. Alright? 7 o'clock here. One of my favorite lines. I'm going to quote it. and You'll catch it in the movie. I'll give you extra popcorn if you catch it in the movie. Okay? God always gives us the answer we would want if we knew what he knew. Okay? See, we're, we're worried and stressed about things that we have no understanding about. And if you're like me, they're probably never going to happen anyway. I'm just being prepared. Be prepared. You know, Boy Scouts rule. No, that's worrying. <clears throat> well, what if this happens? Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Now, this is an incredible illustration. He is taking this right out of the, the Jewish marriage ceremony. Okay? And if you have questions about that, talk to Dennis and Jeannie afterward. Okay? Because it's incredible the way that he's, he's laying this out. Because he's speaking something right to them that they know and understand. We're looking at this going, okay, so he's got rooms. And, okay, but, but there's an entire underlying story here. And I, I don't want to get into it today because I don't want to detract from what I'm trying to hit. So talk to Dennis and Jeannie afterwards because it's incredible. All right? So there are many rooms. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. I'm fixing up a room for you. Oh, yeah. I got my own room. <laughs> You guys can laugh, but I had a lot of brothers. <laughs> and if I go and prepare a place for you, now this is kind of one of those duh statements, isn't it? <clears throat> if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you will also be. That's like saying, um, I built a house for you. You can't live there. 
Too bad for you. <laughs> it's my house. I built it for you, with you in mind, with the sole purpose of you having it, but you can't have it. But this, that's not what he's saying, is it? What he's saying makes logical sense to us. I'm building a place for you. I'm preparing a room for you. And when it's ready, I'm going to come and get you. Really? You've got to talk to Dennis and Jeannie. Okay? Because this is, this is a beautiful picture of the Jewish wedding. Okay? No. Let me rephrase that. The Jewish wedding is a beautiful picture of this. Okay? All right. So... We see that he's going to come back. Why? To get us. Matthew 24. Homework. Uh, this one's easy. This one's easy. Uh, all you need to do this week for homework, read Matthew 24. Because Matthew 24 is all, all about Jesus. He's, he's telling them um, about his coming back. Okay? There's a couple of verses I'm just going to pick out just because they speak specifically to this, but I want you to read it all so you get all of these verses in context. So Matthew 24, all right? Uh, verse 27, he says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Bazak! Now, a couple weeks ago, or, or maybe a year ago, I don't know. It, it was, I know it wasn't a year ago. I know it was this summer. When was the lightning storm that we watched? This summer. Yes. I was right. It was this summer. Good job. Which day? I don't know. It was night. I know it was night. And we got to watch an incredible display of God's power. And we stood out on the back deck, and we could see it in the west, and we got to see it move to the north of us and wrap around to the east of us, and lightning was just... Because BAM! And, and it was just awesome. And there were times where you couldn't actually see the lightning bolt, but you could see the, the sky light up. And it would just, the, the, the entire sky would light up. And it was incredible. But the thing about it is, is that wherever it was hitting, I couldn't see what was happening, but I could see that it was happening. Okay? And in a few minutes, I could hear what was happening. And it lit up. It was obvious. Okay? So when Jesus comes, it's going to be obvious. It's not going to be sneaky, sneaky. It's going to be obvious. Verse 30. He says, uh, Then will appear in heavens the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, now keep in mind, contrast this with his first arrival. Remember, born in a stable, put in the manger, you know, that, that whole thing. There was no room for them, so they had to go and put them in. So, okay, contrast these. The first coming was meek and mild, and the lamb that would be led to slaughter. This coming is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? And so, the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay? And the earth will mourn because they're going to go, Oh! We missed it! Verse 37. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? So first we see he's coming back, what? To get us. To take us. But that's not it. Because there's other things that are going to be going on as well, right? Look at the illustration he's giving here. Noah. Hey, party! Yeah, things are good! What is that? Do you 
hear the sound of rain? Let's go outside and look. Oh, it looks like lightning. Oh, it is the Son of God returned. Till the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. <clears throat> Verse 44. Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay, you get the idea he's coming back? Okay, look, you've got to be more excited than that. Because, see, this is the great hope that we have. Do you get the idea he's coming back? Yeah. Amen. Because, see, if you're not excited about that, check your faith. Okay? Because this is the great hope that's at the end of the race we're running. And if you can't be excited about the prospect of him coming back to take you home, to take you to an eternity with him... I have a challenge for you. Are you willing to accept a challenge? Okay. Um, if you have the bulletin on the back of the notes section, I want you to write something down here. And I want you to be honest. You don't have to share it with anybody. If you don't have a bulletin, you can write on one of the little note cards in front of you. That's fine. I want you to be honest. You don't have to share it with anybody. This is between you and God. I want you to make a list of the things in your life that are important to you. Okay? And now, don't, you don't even start with going, God, when well, you're in church, everybody's going to put that first. Let's just assume that. Okay? Just take a couple minutes and write it down. Make, make your list. And be honest. It's football season. <laughs> Write down the things in your life that are important to you. All right. Now, I want you to take a look at your list. And I want you to consider. Could you, would you, take away those things and replace them with God? And does that fill you with dread or joy? Could you take those things away and replace them with God and find joy? Could you have joy with that? Could you be content with that? Because see, if you're hesitant, if you're not sure, or if you're honest like I was when God confronted me with it and said, nope, God, if you take this away from me, I'm going to be miserable. Okay? You have an idol. You've set up an idol in your life. And, and keep in mind that the children of Israel were sacrificing and sacrificing and sacrificing unto God, and then they would depart and they'd go and camp out under the Asher tree. And they'd go and they'd sacrifice to Molech. And they'd bow down to Baal in their, their houses. Oh, it's the Sabbath. We've got to go sacrifice. As soon as it's done, we've got to go now we got, man, look at the time, look at the time. We've got to get done with this because Molech's waiting. Okay? God will share his glory with nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
okay? And I would challenge you, work on that list, look at that list, submit that list to God. I'm not telling you you have to get rid of those things. I, I don't know what they are. I don't want to know what they are. I have my own list. And things that a year ago were on my list that I would have said, absolutely no way, I can't get rid of these. I, I'm, God, I can't give them up. <coughs> he has made it, so I have let them go. And some of them just turn around and give them right back to me. But in the proper order. Okay, the proper priority. Okay, some of them I still work on. Okay. So don't, don't feel like I'm standing up here like I've, I've got something that you don't. No. Uh, if, if, the only, if nothing else, I only got it before you. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not standing up here in arrogance. I'm standing up here in humility because there were things that God revealed to me that I didn't realize were idols in my life. Okay. So I would challenge you. One of the ways, the easiest ways to look at this is if you look at the second coming of Jesus Christ with anticipation, you're probably in a pretty good spot. But if you look at it in fear and going, I'm not ready, or if you, I, there's things I want to do first, then you don't understand what heaven is going to be like. Mm -hmm. You're contenting yourself with a tent in a city of refuse. When you have a house and a residence, and I homeowners, home development with streets of gold. That's, that's what you have waiting for you, and you're content with a Coleman tent in a city of refuse. Okay? So check. Just, just examine your heart. Are you afraid of him coming back? <coughs> Now, if there's fear because you're not sure where you stand, we can take care of that today. Easy. Easy peasy, rice and cheesy. We can deal with that right now. Okay? But if there is something in your life that you, oh, oh God, I, could you just hold off until I get married? Could you just hold off until I have kids? Could you please hold off until my kids get out of the house? I want to see what it's like. God, could you just hold off until my kids come back home? Because I miss them. I want it the way it was. I want the chaos that I used to gripe about. Okay? Examine yourself. Check and see. Check and see. Definitely a two-parter. Definitely a two-parter, because next week we're going to have to touch on some more things. Father, we bless you today. We thank you, God, that you are so good to us. Father, I thank you that you have promised us in your word that you are coming back, that Jesus is coming back to take us home. Father, you're coming back to set things right. That, Father, all the horrible things we see around us, Father, they're not going to go on forever, because there will be a day when you are going to come in power and authority and glory and you are going to set things right. Fill us, Father, with anticipation for that day. Help us be mindful of the fact that time is short. The fields are ripe unto harvest. And that we are your laborers, Father. And we need more laborers to gather in the harvest. Thank you, Father. We bless you today. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.